other side of the glass clapping. Uh, I just... So everybody knows because Shelly Siegel's been on the show and she's that's her song and then we played it together and did the ukulele. Shelly, come back. <laughs> just come back and hang out. We'll do it again. Maybe do a different song on the ukulele and on that drumstick. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Who are you? No, I'm Matt Delaney, <laughs> host of the Atheist Experience, and this week joining me as a, uh, a new co-host, Jenna Belk. Hi, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. They already like you more than me, so it's, it's good. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I figure we're going to take calls like normal, but I wanted to introduce, you know, obviously the ACA is uh, here. We've been doing this show for 20-some-odd years, and I've been hosting for 15, and from time to time, uh, there are people who um, come and go. And you are the latest potential addition to the Atheist Experience. So I'm going to give you the chance to just introduce yourself to everybody, tell them y your background. I may ask a question, I don't know, and then we'll pick calls and go. Okay. Um, basically, I've been thinking all day and all week really about what to say because I, I feel like everybody's got such a long story. Um, but basically why I'm here is because I, I just want to help. Um, I am a recent deconvert. And about um, seven months ago, we had my final domino fall of becoming an atheist. And that started me on this huge journey um, of how to live a different life, mm -hmm. um, which I'm sure most people who have been theists before have been through. Um, so the final straw that got me to this place was um, I started watching atheist versus theist debates on YouTube and the YouTube algorithms really quickly got me to the atheist experience and so I would have actually called in the show at some point but I had already been deconverted so sure. it just really helped me solidify those final questions that I still had and so after a couple months of watching those shows and then you had like held up an ACA cup and I was like, ACA, cause I'm an AA. And I was like, adult children of alcoholics, what? <laughs> so then I found out, oh, it's atheist community of yeah. Austin. I was like, I'm in Austin. So I decided to come on down here and I don't know if y'all have ever seen Talk Heathen, but Eric Murphy was here and he was very friendly and I just had this wide-eyed face and I was like, I don't, I don't know how I know anything. And so everybody here has been really, really helpful to me for just how to have normal conversations because I'd realized that the conversations that I'd been having were just wrong. Um, well, you picked the right show uh, <laughs> for, for wrong conversations, but yeah. And so this, this show and other shows put on by the ACA have been teaching me how to have conversations. Um, cool. Um, I'm still having a lot of trouble with family sure. and people finding out and trying to have those difficult conversations that I've never had with them before as being on the other side of things. And this is one of those places that I guess now I can come to and have those conversations where people aren't sick of me. <laughs> so I just thought I'd help. No, I appreciate it. For those that don't know, yeah, this is probably your first time seeing Jenna on the show because that's the public-facing thing. But she's been here volunteering at the ACA, and you screen calls from mm -hmm. time to time and everything else. And uh, you did an episode of Nonprofits a couple of weeks ago. And I happened to be here, and I was like, uh, yeah, I think you'd be really good on Nonprofits and running it. But why don't we have you come on the Atheist Experience, and we'll take some calls and see what's up. Uh, today is... I don't know, June 9th, 2019. It's um, Pride Month. Uh, so there's Pride events going on all around uh, the country and possibly the world. Yeah. Uh, ACA participates in a number of those. But also one of the neat things about Austin, uh, and you should move here, by the way. And all those people who are like, you know, keep Austin weird and don't move here. Screw those people. Let's get, this is the atheist yeah. mecca. Just come on down. You'll be fine. <laughs> uh but in addition to all the cool stuff that happens around Austin, including closing down 6th Street for Pecan Street Festival twice a year and then about 10 other times during right. the year for let's just have a party. Friday. Um, there's all sorts of small towns uh, around Austin that were actually settled by German freethinkers. And so the free, th free thought community has been strong in this area uh, right down, you know, in New Braunfels, San Marcos, and, and then you got Wimberley, Georgetown, et cetera. And a lot of them have on one Saturday a month or maybe every other month, they'll have their market days. So in most of these small towns, there's this gorgeous town hall mm -hmm. that is, you know, German architecture and uh, painted up nice and they look really good. 
And then in the town square around there, people will set up booths and sell, I don't know, whatever soap they made or a baby goat or uh, whatever the craft they're in. But I know that members of the atheist community, particularly Atheist Vanguard and others, have been going out to these events and setting up just a booth along with everybody else and come by and talk to us. We've done that at Pride Festivals. We do that kind of whenever we can for the people who are here to participate. And for years, I was president of the ACA, and I, I, I really wanted to push the, the C part, the community part. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've had hit or miss success. The show, okay, the Atheist Experience is the flagship operation of the ACA. It's what draws a lot of people's attention here. But I want people to know that there's 20-some-odd people on the other side of the glass. There's more sitting in the back room. There's more out back. After the show's over, we bring dinner in. Everybody gets to hang out. We are truly building a community. This this office is open, or this building is open seven days a week from 11 to 9. There's always somebody here. There's something going on. We're producing nine shows. There's game nights. There's philosophy nights. Um, if you're not in Austin, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> and if you are in Austin and you haven't been here, what the hell is wrong with you? Uh, we're, we're, we're really doing... Uh, a lot of stuff, and I'm really proud of the, of the way things are going. Uh, there's mistakes. There's, you know, other hiccups and kerfluffles. But, hey, that's how you learn, right? Yeah. And it's like when you were talking about kind of learning how to better have the conversations and how this and other programming w- was beneficial to that, uh, that's the whole reason that we end up doing this. Mm-hmm. And people often will think, oh, you know, uh, they've got a theist on the call, and they're going to beat that theist up in an intellectual bout and convert them. Yeah. And that's almost never one of the top few goals of, of what we're trying to do. No, well, and when I first deconverted, I went through that obvious angry atheist phase where I'm like, I feel lied to, I feel tricked, I feel like I've wasted the first 26 years of my life, you know, I'm, I'm angry. And I started trying to, you know, learn as much as I could just about anything and everything. And the ACA, some of the discussion groups that they've had, somebody pointed me in the direction of street epistemology. And that just gave me some kind of a background for how to start having these conversations in addition to how the conversations go onto this site, on on this forum. And the more and more I learn that my black and white thinking isn't how it's supposed to be. You know, it's it's not there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. And there's not a right way or a wrong way to have these conversations. We just have to do the best we can. There are better and worse ways. A lot. Yeah. And I think one of the key things, you know, I've talked about this before. Number one is is if you're having these conversations, uh, in your case or in in others where it's potentially with family members, Mm -hmm. uh, one thing to keep in mind is you're not selling anything. Right. You you don't owe anybody an explanation for who you are. This goes for everybody, but it's it's come up uh, quite often in, in discussions about the trans community in the last week, which is why it's foremost on my mind. You don't owe anybody an explanation ever for what you are, who you are, how you think, anything, none of that. But if you want to have the conversations, uh, then at least in the, in the realm of, you know, religion, atheists aren't selling anything. We're just the people who are not convinced uh, of what theism is selling, and in some cases are actively convinced that the theists are selling something that is unreasonable, unwarranted, you know, that their reasons for believing this just don't have merit. Right. And that's why we end up having the conversations we have. Yeah, and you keep having so many people coming at me saying, you know, well, what's the harm? And I'm like, well, if you really wanted to know, then we could sit down and have a conversation about it, and I could explain to you the harm that I've found. But if you're just asking just to dismiss me, well, then we're not going to get anywhere. Yeah. So. Hey, that's just like your opinion, man. Yeah. It's... Uh, for the record, I despise that. And uh, while this will probably alienate several fans, I've never been a fan of the Big Lebowski. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, Matt said it out loud. Uh, it's not that I hate it or anything. It's just not me. But So we want to get to some calls and yeah. pick anybody you like. How about Raphael? All right. Raphael. Holy crap, I hit the wrong button. Oh, <laughs> So, this is a professional show that I've been doing for 15 years, and I just hung up on Raphael, which I know Michelle is laughing about tremendously back there. So, pick another one, and, and I won't hang up on them. Oh, let's go with Thomas. Thomas it is. Thomas, you're on the Atheist Experience with Jenna and Matt. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you, Matt and Jenna? Great. How are you? Not too are- bad. Uh, so, Matt, this is going to be my third time calling in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember, but at the end of our last discussion, you told me to look into the fact that you referred to consciousness as an illusion. And for there to be an illusion, something needs to be deceived. 
Uh, so, therefore, consciousness is something other than an illusion. And if consciousness is an illusion, then our minds are something in and of itself. Because we experience the illusion. Do you agree? So, there's a brain that experiences that it gets information from our senses and it processes information on its own. It does thinking. And so there's a brain there which can be deceived. And the notion that consciousness is potentially an illusion upon the brain, um, because what consciousness is is not particularly well defined or well understood, which is why philosophers continue uh, debate, to debate the subject and why scientists are investigating things like, okay, do I make a conscious decision or does my brain make a decision that it then rationalizes as if it were a conscious decision? And there's some science that seems to suggest that your brain makes decisions before you are consciously aware of it. Um, but I'm just going to set all that aside and say, okay, so what? I, I don't know, okay. you know, the, the fact that, so I would agree, and I think you would, that you and I are both conscious, correct? Yes. Whether it's an illusion or something uh, substantive, I, I, I tend to prefer to look at consciousness as, as an emergent property of how a brain functions. You know, so when, when a brain does things, it essentially produces consciousness or what, the things, the experiences that we call consciousness. But I don't know what that has to do with theism, atheism, gods, etc. Okay, well, I'll try to get there. I would agree that consciousness is not well defined, but um, I don't know what your views on AI is, but I don't think AI is conscious, at least not yet. That's what some of the top scientists say. Would you agree that AI is not conscious? I have no reason to think that AI is conscious yet. Um, I, but I also don't have any reason to exclude the fact that it could eventually become conscious. Okay, but for the moment, in the present, they are not conscious. Not as far as I can tell. Okay, so I would, although consciousness may not be well defined, I would refer to consciousness as something. Uh, something in and of itself. Well, I, I don't know... I don't know that I could say it's something in and of itself because it's contingent upon a brain. Like, th we have no examples of consciousness absent a brain, do we? Uh, no, not necessarily. Do we have any examples of consciousness that isn't part of a physical functioning body? No, we don't, but we may not... Does have God have a physical functioning body? God? Uh, no. So God, I, I God's would, not I conscious? Say, I would say that God is consciousness. Well, then you think you have an example of consciousness absent a brain, right? Wait, if God is consciousness... Or, oh, that's different from God is conscious. Yeah, he said God is conscious. Yeah, I'm saying. Okay, so... Yeah, he is consciousness. He is consciousness. So the the thing, the experience that you and I are having, where we would both call that consciousness, you're saying that's God. That is part of God. Yes. How do you know? Uh, I would draw certain logical conclusions to get there, but which ones? First, I would I would I would ask you: Is consciousness has consciousness naturally occurred? I have no evidence that anything that we would say exists has not occurred by any means other than natural. So, okay, so as far as we can tell, whatever consciousness is, it's natural. Okay, so uh, just to clarify, when I refer to myself as I, I am referring to my consciousness. And when I say you, I'm referring to your consciousness. And the same goes for a dog or a mouse. You're not and talking when something. So when you yeah, say when you, you're not talking not, about me and my body and my consciousness and everything about me. You're just when you say you, you're talking just to someone's consciousness. Yes, I, I believe that that is what I is or you is. So when I'm asleep, when I'm asleep, does that mean I stopped existing? I had a feeling you might say that, Matt, but cool. no, it does not mean you have. It, it does not mean you have stopped existing. 
but it does mean you are not conscious at that moment unless you are perhaps dreaming or well, something. Well, that would that would also potentially be subconscious, although it might there may be. But in any case, there are moments where I'm not conscious, even though I'm still a potential thinking agent. And so, what Jenna was asking about, you know, are you only referring to someone's consciousness as the I and you? Well, clearly, that there's a problem there, because there are things about me that either aren't directly a part of my consciousness or may be present in the absence of my conscious awareness. Like what? What could be present? My pinky. Of your consciousness. My pinky. Well, that's 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 part of your body. Correct. Which is not part of my consciousness. Okay, so it's part of my body. Let's just take my whole body. Okay, so when someone dies, their consciousness is no longer with that body. So they're them, they're not there. And their body is there, but they are not there. Or would you say that they are still there? So do you mean consciousness or do you mean soul? Uh, I'm referring to consciousness. Okay. And that, is that different? Uh, so I have not taken the time to define a soul. Uh, I guess some people may call it a soul, but I'm referring to it as consciousness. Okay, so I just went to my grandmother's funeral uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, clearly, she's no longer conscious. And yet everything else about her body is still there. And so the question becomes, is she there? Now, I understand the natural feeling. This is, this is how we got to the idea of a soul in the first place, is I'm standing here talking to Jenna, I drop dead, and all of a sudden I'm not able to move or function, and the only reasonable conclusion that, or the inference that J Jenna can make is there's something about me that used to be here and is not here anymore. That's kind of what you seem to be yeah. talking about with guard. However, the question I have is, the consciousness is no longer there. My grandmother's dead. She's not conscious. There's no consciousness there. I also recognize that uh, the rest of the person is still there. I realize that consciousness is the part that we care about. It's one of the big reasons we make this distinction between the living and the dead. But I have no evidence that her consciousness went somewhere. It's what I have evidence for is that her brain stopped functioning and producing the thing that we call consciousness. That's it. So even if we were in complete agreement that the consciousness is the self, and I think there's a context in which I'm kind of okay with that, when somebody dies and there's no longer a consciousness there, um, th there is a justifiable context in which you can say that person no longer exists. I, I don't think she's going to keep getting a social security check. But we have no reason to think that the consciousness goes anywhere in the notion that what Jenna was pointing to about the distinction between a consciousness and a soul. Do you think the consciousness goes somewhere, and why would you think that? Well, uh, do I think it goes somewhere? Well, a moment ago, you referred to consciousness as something. You said if you were to drop there in the studio that Jenna would realize something is no longer there. I said that was a reasonable inference, yeah. But, okay, well, but it's not necessarily a thing that packed up and left. So, In the same way that when I'm laying here dead, I'm no longer breathing either, but my breath didn't pack up and go somewhere. So how do you know when you look well, yes, at... yes, actually it did. So how do you know when uh, you look at a person and you look at a computer and then a person dies and the computer turns off? How do you know that there is some part of the person that is missing versus it turned off? Or the computer is missing a part now that it's off or it's just off? Like, do you see, how do you know that there's something that left the person but not something left the computer? Well, a computer, you can fix it. It's, I mean, c comparing the computer to a human is kind of complicated, but uh, you can fix a computer. You can see what has malfunction. You can replace parts. You can do that with and, humans. Yeah, but you, that won't bring the human back to life. I mean, if you but break you your can. arm, you can fix it. If you get a concussion, you can get better. You, you I mean, you can hurt get yourself. Get an artificial heart. You can get repair to hearts. You can have all, all kinds of Get blood donated. Yeah, but I was referring to death, and after death, there's no way to repair a human. 
Well, currently. Yes, currently. I mean, what we used to call, first of all, death is, is actually probably best viewed as a process. And, you know, perhaps you're not dead until you're uh, either warm and dead or cold and dead, depending on the circumstances that led to you no longer being uh, considered alive. But we revive people on operating tables all the time that would otherwise just die. If you left them alone, they would die. But if you um, apply an electric shock and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and stuff, you can manually manipulate a body so, so, that, so that it remains alive. Now, I don't know what's down the future in, in the sci-fi realm with the transhumanists. Maybe, you know, maybe if you freeze a body in the right way in 100 years, you can thaw it out and make it work again. I don't know. But at the end of the day, we're talking about her example with the computer is essentially if the computer breaks and you have no way of knowing how to fix it, it's off in the same way that if a body breaks and you have no way of knowing how to fix it, it's now off. And I don't there see... There is a difference. Okay, what is it? Oh, I, there is a find, difference. It's an analogy, but I mean, what's... You can, you can find someone to fix that knows how to fix the computer because humans made the computer. We actually even, we put the codes and the programs into the computer you don't, you don't get to any uh, code if it doesn't power on. Okay, so on to that point, we can get people that can replace the parts of whatever's broken. Sure, but and run well, diagnostic. Can you do that and fix it? Can you do that? I cannot. I, okay, I'm not a so computer so you, you can't do that. So now let's say you're the only human left on the planet, and your computer dies. Now, now well, there's. I would, no know, I would know that my knowledge is limited, but there is a way for me to gain knowledge and be able to fix it for myself. Possibly, I would know that that's possible. Possible, so I but know that's possible. Uh, no, it's it's not necessarily possible if you're the only person left. It may be yeah, that I could. You could never, perhaps, learn that information. Yeah, it's possible. Okay. But at but the end I of the day, that none of that matters. The fact, human. no, here's the thing. The fact that we know how to fix a computer and don't know how to fix a human is completely irrelevant to what we're talking about, which is you think that the consciousness goes somewhere from a human being and you don't think that there's anything that goes somewhere when a computer stops working. Because a computer is not conscious. So do why do you is? think that there is something leaving the person, but there is not something leaving the computer? That's a little bit more specifically what I'm asking. Okay, okay, oh, okay, well... Let me respond. There could be nothing to leave the computer because the computer is not conscious. That's just All an assertion. Consciousness. See, so no, we've, we've so already, you, no, 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 so stop, think, stop. We've already agreed that consciousness is ill-defined and not particularly understood. But if your entire argument is it's not conscious, therefore it doesn't fit the example, then we're wasting time because that's a fallacy called poisoning the well. We're trying to come up with examples. Let's set aside the computer entirely what on earth makes you think consciousness leaves and goes somewhere else and continues to exist outside of a body? Well, I would not, I would not be able to think that if consciousness, as you once said, is true. It is just, it has formed over time and it has not always existed. Uh, so is that your belief that we come from, you know, the beginning of the Big Bang, the model, I'm sure this is an answer to some question, but it's not even in the same ballpark as the question I asked, which is what makes you think consciousness leaves people and goes somewhere? Well, that, that was never my point. You asked me, do I think that consciousness goes somewhere, but... He asked you what makes uh, you think that. I don't think it goes somewhere. I just think it still exists. Why? After. Well, if, if, you, if you think it still exists... Well, no, no, answer. stop. We've already agreed that the person is no longer conscious, right? Yes. And you think the consciousness still exists. So the inference is there that it had to go somewhere. Are you saying that the consciousness still exists in that person? It's just that it's not evident? I know you're right. I, I suppose it would. that means it has to go somewhere. If okay. It still exists. And, and all we're wanting to know is... What justification would anybody have for reaching that conclusion? Uh, well, I would like to answer that with um, a syllogism. I believe that that might work. Uh, that's okay. a form of reasoning. Uh, using two known premises, we can conclude a third. Yes. 
okay, do you, well, do, do you know the difference between validity and soundness within syllogisms? No, I do not. Okay. So, so okay, validity so. goes to the structure of a syllogism. There are a number of different forms that you can use. Um, and some of them are valid, which means true premises need to lead to true conclusions. And some of them are invalid, which means that the true premises don't necessarily lead to a true conclusion. And then soundness is a judgment on whether or not the premises are true or accepted to be true. And so in order for a syllogism to be sound, it has to be valid in structure. And then it has to have premises that are true or accepted if we're just talking about basic reasoning. So what, what's your syllogism? Okay, I'll give my syllogism and you can tell me if it's sound. Uh, something has always existed. Consciousness is something. Therefore, consciousness has always existed. It's not only not sound, it's not valid. You, 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 ha you have a structure there where your premises, uh, your major and minor terms are not structured in a way that is actually valid. Because something has always existed. Matt is something. Therefore, Matt has always existed. See well, the problem? I refer to Matt. I refer to his consciousness. Okay. In the blank with okay. Anything. All right. Fine. Something has always existed. This cell phone exists. Therefore, this cell phone has always existed. Now, yes. do you see the problem? That self yes, but that cell phone is not intrinsic. It, it does not naturally occur. Yeah, nothing about your syllogism included anything about intrinsic or naturally occurring. Now, instead of recognizing that you've shown up with a syllogism that is invalid and unsound, you're just backpedaling to try to make excuses, and that would be an ad hoc or a post hoc fallacy. Well, a, a moment ago, I asked you, did consciousness naturally occur? And I said, therefore, that means consciousness is intrinsic. Okay, I, I agree that as far as I can tell, consciousness is naturally occurring, which means by definition, consciousness has not always existed. It occurred. Mm. See, if you take your syllogism, you're basically starting with, uh, wow, well, I, I, I'm having trouble even putting it back together. Um, <laughs> something. Your first premise is something has existed forever. Okay, right? Yeah, yes. I, I don't necessarily know that that first premise is sound at all. I have no evidence that something has in fact existed forever. And so the first well, premise, okay. hang on, hang on. The first premise is already questionable. I have no reason to think that there is something that has existed forever. Okay, so there's a problem in the well, first in premise. Our, but In a previous uh, conversation... I've, I've asked you, can non-existence exist, or can nothing exist? And you said, there's no reason for you to think that nothing can exist. So therefore, something Doesn't has mean always that. existed. Sure, okay, now, now I see the problem. Um, when you say something has always, always existed, you are, you're, you are saying some thing has, already, has always existed. Your second premise, though, is then... This is a thing, okay? And therefore, your conclusion is this thing has always existed. And the, the reason I went with the cell phone example or eyeglasses or anything, the fact that there is something that has always existed does not mean that a specific thing has always existed. So, okay. Uh, I have a, one more question. Well, I, I'm, uh, do, I, hang on, hang on. I want to make sure you get that. So let's change the first pr premise. Uh, or let's, let's look at it this way. Do you think that everything that exists has always existed? Uh, in the terms of energy, yes, but not... Okay. What specific things have turned out, like trees and things like that? Has this pair of glasses always existed? No. Okay. So now we have a second premise. There are some things that have not always existed. And now we need to figure out if the thing that you're claiming, consciousness, 
is in the set of things that has always existed or the set of things that has not always existed, and that is the problem. How do you demonstrate that? Mm. Cannot demonstrate that. Uh, well, I guess that <clears throat> I guess that my syllogism was not it was not sound or valid. Uh, I guess I'll work on another one. Okay, that's but, very uh, honest of I, you. Yeah, before I go, I just want to wanted to ask you, Matt, uh, just to be clear, uh, you say consciousness did not exist at the beginning of the Big Bang. I have no idea whether but, consciousness existed then or not. I don't have any reason to think it did, but I can't show that it didn't. And and the the other question but, you might ask yourself is, what does any of this have to do with whether or not there's a God? Well, if I could, if if it was true, if I could ever logically conclude that consciousness has always existed, then I would assume that whatever that was is probably a God. Okay, that's another fallacy, because the, even if we could demonstrate consciousness has always existed, the next question in that chain would be, what is it that serves as a, a foundation for consciousness always existing? And you're going to reach the conclusion that that's a God, and I'm then going to ask you, how did you reach that conclusion? Because as far as I can tell, that would at, at a minimum uh, just be like an argument from personal incredulity. I can't think of any other explanation for consciousness, therefore God is the best explanation. But you don't get to use God as an explanation until you demonstrate that a God is possible, plausible, and a potential explanation. I mean, I, I'm not trying to beat you up here, Thomas, because if this was easy, we wouldn't have been doing a show. There'd be no debate or question about whether or not a God exists. There are people that are, uh, have been working on this far longer and far, with far more uh, understanding of logic and reason and evidence than you and I will ever have. And we, d we still don't have any sort of logically sound argument supported by evidence that would lead one to rationally conclude that a God exists. If we did, we wouldn't be doing the show. Yeah, I guess yeah. you're right. It's uh, frustrating as hell. I, and it's not just frustrating f for you and other people who are on your side of this. It's frustrating for us as well because imagine waking up every day in a world where the overwhelming majority of people believe something you don't and, I don't know, act and vote based on those beliefs and things like that. And that determines how they're going to treat each other and how they're going to treat other people and what rights people are going to get. And all you're doing is sitting here going, hang on a minute. I'm not convinced that you have a good reason for that. Can you explain it to me? And all you ever get are fallacious arguments and a vacuum devoid of evidence for the proposition. That's a bizarre world to live in. Well, Matt, uh, you have a great show. Uh, you're an intelligent man, and I always enjoy talking with you. Thank you, Thomas. I, I enjoy when you call. Yeah, thank you for having me on the show again. I appreciate it. Sure. You can thank Jenna because she picked you. <laughs> pick, pick another one. Um, I'll try not to hang up on this one either. <laughs> Let's go with Clint. Clint. I think I can help on Clint that. Clint, South Carolina, you're on with Jenna and Matt. Hey, Jenna. Hey, Matt. Hi. Um, How you doing? Great. I'm really, I'm really happy I, I, I got through to you. Um, <laughs> so I've been watching a lot of your podcasts. This is the first time I've... I'm calling in or thought about calling in on this. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'd just like to quickly try and steel man your position on skepticism. Okay. Um, your objective basically is to believe as many true things as possible and believe as many false things or okay. as, as few false things as possible, right? Hard for me to deny that when I put it on a t-shirt. So yes, that's accurate. <laughs> okay. And, and, to that end, you think the best way to go about that is uh, skepticism. So Meaning, sc skepticism um, are the principles behind how I would go about investigating a claim, but the it's not like skepticism that convinces me of something. It is the weight of the evidence that convinces me of something. Okay. 
Okay. Skepticism but is the method by which we go about figuring out what evidence should be necessary, what evidence is good, whether or not an argument is valid or sound, whether or not the evidence is that we're, we're viewing is reliable, that sort of thing. It's kind of like a, a it, it, is the, it is the position of having the goal to be more right than wrong and finding the best methods to do that. It's not that skepticism itself right. is necessarily the method. It includes scientific methods, et cetera. Exactly. Yeah. Obviously, I would agree that, you know, starting at logic, then mathematics, then science, building up, you know, from one to the other is the, the tools in which we use to, you know, discover truth. Well, you just I, I agree with you again, Clint. This is going to be the easiest thing ever because we just keep agreeing. <laughs> so, 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 but, but my, my, my question is, is the method you go about, uh, ordering your your logical arguments you would define as skepticism right so you're skeptical if there's a fallacy leading to a conclusion you you'd be skeptical of that conclusion oh well, of course but that's not the only a a fallacious argument is not the only well i'm skeptical of everything uh, this exercise of doubt, of not being convinced, of thinking that something perhaps doesn't warrant being convinced, that uh, is certainly heightened when we identify a fallacy in the argument and, or a flaw in the evidence for it. Um, those aren't the only reasons that I would not be convinced of something. Right. I actually took your, your challenge pretty seriously when you encourage people at, I think it was the last atheist convention to investigate logic and reason. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I did, I came away thinking more than ever, actually, that belief is the best way, not skepticism. And I think I can, I think I can try and explain why. Okay. Could you, before you, um, before you explain why, could, could you explain what? When you say belief okay. is a better way than skepticism, so, I that that's belief, that's to me like saying conclusions are a better way than methods. Well, okay, so I will I will right now personally one hundred percent agree that there is no deductive way of getting from evidence to God. Okay. Um, however, I don't think there's a, a lot of things that, I mean, if, if, if there's, if there's things that are material, you can definitely get from deductive evidence, you know, A, B, B, I got you. B, C equals C, A, anyway, um, you can definitely get there that way. Um, but when it comes to things like abstract things like personal freedoms and 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 concepts like god or spiritual you know uh entities or anything along those lines you can't necessarily rely i, I would say i don't believe that we've reached a technological point to where we have we can we can definitively say that those things don't exist. Well, oh, 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 why would you go with saying those things don't exist instead of saying, I don't think we can say they do exist? Right. Because first of all, abstract things don't exist. They are mental constructs. So they don't exist in the absence of minds, as far as we can tell. It's not like hope is something that exists out there that we're tapping into. Hope is something we have and we do. Okay. So, so I would agree with you that when it comes to material things, you can create deductive arguments supported by evidence. Boom, these glasses exist, this phone exists, whatever. For abstract right. things, why would you presume that there is an attainable truth value for them at all? Well, why would you not? Isn't that isn't that a uh, isn't that a logic um, appeal to logic? Well, no. See, see, one of the things is that you have to begin with some kind of default position, and you can either, for example, and that's that's kind of where I'm going with this. The default position 
should be believed because you're going to okay, get more. Okay, so then your default position, then your default position, according by by that, would mean that you would have to believe in Jesus, Muhammad, Scientology, uh, Jainism, or yeah, Jainism. Uh, pick them all. You'd have to believe all of them until you could prove that one of them wrong or more than one of them wrong, right? Absolutely. So do you, do you so believe all of them? You need to investigate. No, hell no. Because I've investigated several of them, and I found them to be fallacious. So, so but, you. But here's the thing. But I can't rule out the others yet because I haven't investigated them all yet. Okay. What if I make but one up tomorrow? I, nope. Well, I'll believe that too until I can prove it. Okay. Oh, cool. This is this is nuts, Clint. And, and this is nuts. And I'm gonna I'm gonna fix this real quick. Nobody's saying you have to be able to rule things out. I'm saying if the default position is not to believe things until there's evidential warrant for it, now I'm in a position where I don't believe any of the world's religions, and as soon as one of them demonstrates that it is real, I can now accept it. You are in a position where you have to accept every religion and then start picking them off. Well, the fact that you haven't yet picked off these eight uh, already doesn't tell you which, if any of them, are true. They could all be false. And second, it puts you in a position where you are forced to believe things that are contradictory. Jesus can't be God as well as somebody else being God. Well, I agree with that. And okay. I would also argue that the Bible doesn't support that. But <laughs> Are we talking about the Bible? I, I, don't, I don't know what you well, meant by that. Okay, so well, I'm, I'm assuming I'm assuming you're talking about the Trinity and you know the doctrine of you know the three and one. You know, false no, false I wasn't thinking about that. the Trinity at all. I'm pointing out that it's like I, I'm not a sports ball guy, but there are sports that I like. So let's say you're watching the top ten curling teams, and you're sitting there trying to figure out which one is the best. And you watch you you watch a couple of games, and you find out some of the teams that lost, and you can say, "Yep, they're not the best." But what you're telling me is you're going to believe all the rest of them are the best until such time as you're shown to be wrong. Yeah, but that'll take about thirty seconds when once you compare scores. So that's kind of where I'm going. Like you can rule some of these things out really quickly. Up until the moment where you ruled things out, where you had scores, you started the tournament thinking that all teams were the best and all teams were going to win that tournament. And that position is demonstrably false. So you started before any data with a position that necessarily must be false. How can that possibly be a reasonable way to proceed through the world? Okay, let me let me make a, an analogy. I just uh, did. Maybe I'm maybe maybe I'm fault. Maybe I'm screwed up here. So that's why I was calling in to to find out. Is because okay, so in a syllogistic form, right? You can have premise, true premise. We'll, we'll we'll stick with just true premises because there's really like nine categories if we go true and false premises, but um, you can have a true premise, true premises with fallacious reasoning leading to a false conclusion. No, you can I, have well, well true it, that would be an invalid structure syllogism. I don't yeah, know why exactly. we're going. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So you said you were going to come with an analogy and now we're back to the same logic 101 thing we were talking okay. about with the yeah. last call. Okay. What's wrong with just addressing the analogy that I've given and showing how your okay. position that believing all of the teams are the best and are going to win at the beginning of the tournament is the right position. It can't be right. Okay. If, you're, if your question is that they are going to win, then my position is no, the rules of the game say only one can win. Yeah. Immediately. That's right. pre, pre-reason, right? Yeah. Because the rules of the game automatically stipulate that. Yeah. Okay, so your your question is already a trap. No. Oh well it is a trap and I'm and I'm it's unfortunate for you because it's a trap that you laid. <laughs> you laid this trap of saying that belief is preferable to the investigation. 
You laid this trap no, in. No, I didn't say that at all. Yes, you did Listen, because you. Uh, this, that's why I objected to to prioritizing conclusions over the methods. Right. Okay. So that was my mistake. Okay. I okay. didn't. I didn't. I didn't communicate my 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 position on this. But one, here's the thing: it, it's still true for the various God claims. Okay, there's a whole bunch of God claims out there. Some of them you have found problems with, so you disregard those. But you're sitting here saying that you're going to believe all the rest of them until such time as you can exclude those. Which means you're starting with well, a position yeah, that... I'm using, I'm using evidence to exclude things. Do you... From, from a... Let me, from let me, a, let me from just a, ask this. Wouldn't it be friends. better? Wouldn't it be better to not believe that any of them are real until the evidence suggests, in fact, one of them is. Well, no, because then you're leaving out the you're you're presupposing that the premise is, can only no, be you're false not false until it's proven. True. No, you're saying you don't know yet. Okay, but when you're talking about something that either is or isn't, you don't know yet. You don't know. There's either a Did, diamond shaped like my head on Mars or there's not. Which one is it? If we're playing tic-tac-toe after the show, there is a winner and a loser. Which is it? I'm, I'm, you just don't I'm know sorry. yet. What was the, if, if Matt yeah, and I are going well, to play yeah. a game after this show that has not happened yet, and there is going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser... But it hasn't happened yet. Well, is there a tic-tac-toe, winner and a loser? That it's most likely to be a tie, but... I don't know. I'm not that good at tic-tac-toe. <laughs> but, but also, um, Jen is talking about something in the future because it makes it clarify. But this works in the past as well. Let's say uh, somebody was murdered. We don't know who it is, but we have 10 suspects. Are you going to start by believing all 10 of them did it and then start ruling them out? Or are you going to... Begin with the presumption. I'm going to believe they're all innocent and then start. Or just you say just you don't advocated know. for the exact opposite position from what you were advocating before. This is why skepticism no, is. Not at all. Yes, it is absolutely. This is why skepticism is so important and so critical because it establishes a burden of proof and a default position that ensures that you are not engaged in cognitive dissonance, so that you're not simultaneously believing two things that are mutually exclusive. It sounds to me like you're saying, I'm going to pick the one that I want to believe first, and then I'm going to figure out which is true later. And we're saying, I'd rather know what's true and then decide what to believe. That's all. That's the only difference. Okay, here's, here's, my, yeah, here's, here's, here's my take on why I think belief is better. I, I prefer knowing more true things than not knowing false things. You don't know anything. Your position does not... I don't either. Your, I don't either. Your position okay. does not get you... First of all, my statement was I'd rather... I want to believe as, believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. Right. I don't know why you switched it to knowledge, but the second you do, now it seems oh, that you... No, 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 no. You're absolutely right. Belief is definitely my position. Sure. I, so I, do you want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible? Absolutely. Then you cannot and, simultaneously. And favor, then you cannot. You cannot simultaneously believe in multiple gods. And I favor. No, I favor believing more true things than less false things. Okay, so you d- rather, you don't care for an. I would rather err on the side. I would rather err on the side of possible. No, see that's the thing. You're the you're making a simple possible. math error. If you say, so like, I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. And you say the same thing, except that you want to err on believing as many true things as possible. So that puts you in a position where you're going to believe things. You are going to believe that something is true when it is actually false. So you're not actually believing more true things. You are, in fact, believing more false things are true. Okay, but... Okay, I guess that makes sense to a, to a point. Well, when you find the point where it stops making sense, that's where I'd like to have a conversation because I see no point at which that stops making sense. Well, okay, so I guess my, my initial starting point was maybe incorrect. I want to avoid the appeal to, the appeal to logic fallacy. 
the the fallacy fallacy that even even if you have true statements with a with a with with a fallacy you can still arrive at a true conclusion yes but the okay here's the thing when you have a syllogism if it's valid true premises necessarily lead to true conclusions if it's invalid whether your premises are true or not true is completely independent your conclusion could be true or not true that's why we don't use invalid syllogisms they have to be valid in structure and then it's all about whether or not the premises are reasonable and true Right, but you can't ignore the 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 possibility of uh, who's doing that conclusion Who, from. Uh, oh my God! You're calling the atheist experience a show I've hosted for 15 years, where I have encouraged theist callers over atheist callers to call in and present evidence for their God. Who the fuck is ignoring this? <laughs> I, this has been my entire life to call in and suggest. I mean, I know that's not what you meant, and I know it's kind of something you fell into. No. But we're definitely not ignoring this. All I want, okay. all I want, is good arguments supported by good evidence to show that any claim is true or likely true. To where it, it, I okay. would accept anything that is supported by good argument and good evidence. Same. Okay. So that's that's probably where I was misunderstanding you then. Yeah. Um, just uh, it says here as a quick note. More, it, it says here as a quick note from the from the caller. Uh, the little side note says it's better to believe in something rather than nothing, and we didn't actually get to that. <laughs> But I think Jenna can can solve this real quick. Yeah, that was going to be. That's why I picked you. No offense, but <laughs> um, I think that. So when you say it's uh, better to believe in something than nothing, well, I think it first depends on what the something is that you believe you know it i believe in kindness i believe in honesty i believe in so many things like i don't understand why i have to believe in a fairy tale too yeah and and so this thing about it's better to believe in something rather than nothing i don't know anybody who believes in nothing yeah i mean that's as big of a straw man as suggesting you know we, we're dismissing the notion of god so right yeah and i would never i would never assert that 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 anybody believed nothing yeah it may be the case you you'd be in a nihilistic void if you believed nothing. <laughs> yeah, it may be the case that what, what you're kind of leaning towards, what, which we've heard a lot, is that when it comes to the God thing, it may in fact be better to pick one than to sit on the sidelines and wait until there's good evidence. And I would point out that what if you pick the wrong one? Yeah. What What if you decide that uh, Muhammad is? Uh, you know, the true prophet of God, and then Jesus sends you to hell, or vice versa. Or you missed out on uh, Buddhist reincarnation. Hercules is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the thing is, and this is yet just another example, it's not that, first of all, belief isn't a choice. You are either convinced or you're not, but you can make some choices about how you're going to evaluate evidence and what you're going to favor and things like that. So you can kind of pollute the process of thinking. Skepticism has as its primary goal the removal of that pollution to make things as um, unbiased as possible. We'll never get to be truly unbiased uh, and even computers won't because by the time we get AI that works like us, they'll probably have biases and, and potentially be conscious. But we'll save that for another call. But if, if, the, right. if the thing is Can that for the people who are operating on some sort of Pascal's wager of I'd rather believe this or I feels like I should believe this or I can't just sit by and wait. I need to make a choice. I need to make a choice now. Those choices and those decisions and what you believe have consequences for all of us. And so if you pick, uh -huh. if you are convinced of a religious belief that then encourages you to, I don't know, spend your money in a certain way, vote in a certain way, treat people in a certain way, those are potential consequences from this. And to say that it's better for you to just take a position because it hasn't been shown to be false and ignore all the potential harm from that, not the least of which is well, that- Well, absolutely not. I would never advocate that. I would. You wouldn't, I, I, but I you did. No. You, you, you did. You did, Clinton. And here's how. You, you didn't do it in the sense of advocating for bad positions or policies or anything else. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. The process by which you come to a decision about any claim is not exclusive to that claim. 
And so if you become convinced that you have lucky socks and a lucky rabbit's foot for bad reasons, that same flawed reasoning still exists in your head and you have now amplified it as if it's a good thing. And so you are encouraging yourself to continue to believe more things that are probably false. Can I ask you a question, Clint? Absolutely. Do you believe in prayer? Do you believe that prayer works? Um, so far as you act in harmony with it, which is as simple as saying almost never. Almost um, never. <laughs> do you think that it would matter if there's a large portion of our planet who do believe that prayer works? Again, I don't think so much that what people, I mean, only, only so far as what they, only so far as the actions they take in relation to it. Like praying? Like, like, okay, so they say they, let's say they, they, they pray and say, ask for, you know, a raise at work. Well, if they work real hard or something like that and they get a raise, well, I mean, it's pretty self-evident, you know, that either, either the, the, it, there's no, there's no definitive proof that prayers are answered. So the reason, so, the, sorry, the reason that I asked, I, I guess what I'm saying, mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is only so far as your agency allows you to work toward that goal. So sometimes? I mean, well, I'm, I, think I, I think I forgot. I think I got sidetracked off of your original question. Your original question was something about... Um, Does, do you think prayer works? Do I think prayer works? Okay, yeah. So, no, I guess my, I, my answer wasn't that far off. Only so far as your actions, you work towards that goal. So as, as far as an... As far as, again, I can't prove that God exists, so I'm not saying that he does. Are you I saying... I think I can... Are you saying if you I do can, other things in addition to prayer, then prayer works? Prayer on its own, I would say, is unlikely to work. Okay. Do you think then... You have to act in harmony with your prayers. So... So if I have a headache and said a prayer and took an aspirin... Is that when prayer works? <laughs> well, the reason the I reason mean, that I'm asking, and this is a serious thing, is because there are a lot of reasons for that. But sure, right? Yeah. There are a lot of people out there that think that prayer works, and not only does it work, but it is the solution for problems. Okay, I lived a lot of my life believing that if I had a problem, all I had to do was close my eyes and pray. So there were a lot of problems that I didn't get fixed until much later because I didn't think that there was a way to find those problems outside of in my head talking to Jesus. So I think that that is just one of the huge problems with flawed thinking. Um, people live their lives this way. Can, it, can you prove prayer doesn't work? Again, I can't. Okay, then wouldn't, um, wouldn't you be forced to believe prayer, prayer works based on your own methodology of believing something until it's proved to not be true? I mean, trust me, I don't want to convince you to believe that prayer works, but I'm just pointing, pointing out a problem with your methodology. I, mean, I, I would, you're, you're, you're right in, a, you're right. I mean, I guess by my own reasoning, I would have to say that until, until I can rule out that, okay, so I would, well, okay. I, you, <laughs> hey, let me, let me make this even more difficult. Let, talking about it. Let me, let me make this even more difficult, Clint. Right. I'm going to make this even more difficult. Can you prove prayer doesn't work? Can I prove prayer does not work? Again, prayer necessarily requires a deity, so no. I, 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 I don't know how we got to there, but <laughs> yeah, I didn't. the point is you can't prove prayer does not work, so you would have to believe that it does under your methodology. You also can't prove prayer does work, which means by your methodology you would have to believe that it doesn't. 
And so now you're in a position because of your methodology where you would have to both simultaneously believe it does work and it doesn't work. That is the problem. It's called cognitive dissonance, and this is the thing that skepticism is trying to avoid. Jenna and I can sit here and say, we are not convinced that prayer works, and as soon as you present sufficient evidence that prayer works, we'll accept that. And until such time, there's no reason to think that it does work. Does that mean we're saying prayer doesn't work? No. But, but that's, that's taking two, two opposite ends of an argument and working against each other, right? Isn't that isn't that already? You, didn't a, you just? Isn't that a definition of argument? <laughs> you you have well, two two possibilities, yes, but, and you pose the two yes, against each other, and you really you, argue both sides yourself, right? I mean, I argue both sides myself all the time. That's how I got to be able to do this. <laughs> well, okay, but again, it's it's no, that's not a joke. Being able to consider both both prongs of a dilemma and address them both fairly and determine, do I have reason to believe one or the other? Or if I'm in a position where I don't have reason to believe either, all of those have to be options. That is the process of skepticism that tries to remove the bias that we all feel. Because I'm sure at some point, both of us would have loved it if prayer worked. Both of us would have loved it if the God that we believed in was real. Mm -hmm. But we were, as far as we can tell, wrong. Not necessarily wrong about the fact, but wrong in our reasoning that led to that conclusion. And so we scrubbed our brains as best we could of the flawed reasoning. And if there's a God or a supernatural thing that is true and real, it has nothing to fear from inquiry, questioning, doubt. The truth has nothing to fear from investigation. And so if, the, if there's a God, and you've already acknowledged you can't get from evidence to a deduction about God, why is that the case? Because if I were God, there would be evidence. If I was a God who wanted people to know that I existed, wanted to have people have sound evidentiary warrant for their beliefs, there would be mountains of evidence. I mean, he's not God and there's mountains of evidence. Yeah. Oh. I'm more powerful so than God. I... <laughs> well, okay, so... And so are you. <laughs> I mean, there, there are... There, I, I really hate to get into actual uh, theological discussion. I'd really rather. Oh, I love it. A, <laughs> uh, seriously, that's why I'm. That's actually a, uh, why I'm here. Because I realized because at my final deconversion point, I had realized that I had never heard the atheist side of the debate. I had only heard the Catholic side. I had only heard what my family and my friends and everybody that I knew had told me about atheists. And atheists don't have morals. And atheists don't know what to, atheists are this and atheists are that. But I had never asked right. an atheist, hey, what do you think? And that's the difference between the position that I'm in today and the position that I used to be in and that I'm trying to talk to the people in my family about is that I know where you I know where you are. I've been there. I've thought the things that you do. You've never actually been an well, atheist. Oh, well, this is just me in my personal situation right now is that they've ne they don't know what my side of this argument is and they're still arguing. But if you can understand both sides, then you can decide logically which one is more or likely to be real or neither. Or neither. And, and kudos to you for calling in because you're you're at least engaging in part in you know having yeah. the discussion, which is more than a lot of people will do. Right. No, I'm 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 interested in like you in believing as many true things as possible and as many false things as possible. And <laughs> as far as Catholic beliefs, you so, you said you said many false yeah. things again when you, when you really meant few. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's, it's all right. I do that a lot. I'm dyslexic, so it. Sometimes my thoughts get anyway, um, but um, now, now, now that now that you've gone down the dyslexic, yeah, I was going to. I'm really bothered by the fact that I ended up using a double negative, which ended, you know ended up being more confusing. <laughs> people. I tell you what, though, Clint, uh, we we've we got like 25 minutes or so left, and a, and a bunch of callers. Why don't you call us back another time? Um, I'm I'm sure I'll be around. Uh, I'll be around a lot more, but I'm sure Jen will be around more too. We'd love to talk to you some more, but uh, I want to get to the other callers, too. Just keep asking questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Thank okay. you, sir. Thanks. Uh, where to? I guess Duke. 
Duke it is. Duke in Virginia, you're on with Jenna and Matt. Afternoon, how's everybody today? Great, how are you? Fat, dumb, and happy. <laughs> What'd you say, unhappy? Fat, fat, dumb, and happy. It's it. Oh, uh, okay, well, that's kind of me. I'm, I'm also old, so that gives me an extra bonus. There you go. All right, so uh, I guess you saw the question. I'm looking at it I now. Correct? Um, oh, uh, I, I posted a video this past week or week before about whether or not there's evidence for God and... Uh, I gave an example about me killing a fictional person named Steve and what counts as evidence and what doesn't, and you wanted to address that? Well, in, a, in some respect, but I'd kind of like to take a, a different approach. As you know, sure. my question is, in your scenario, Matt kills Steve, and then you point out if Steve, if Matt exists, then that is evidence that it happened. So what I really want to get to is, Without the evidence, what, well, I mean, what other evidence do you have? Let's say that Steve was killed, but Matt doesn't exist. There has to be some other explanation for how Steve got killed, correct? Yep. Okay. So this is my only objection to the atheist debates. And, and i got to say, you're among my favorite of the celebrity atheists out there. Comment in your, uh, on your videos frequently. And it was almost as if you were reading my comments because I'd always wanted to call the show and say, you know, you are aware that there is evidence for a God. You don't have to accept it, but it does exist. But you've acknowledged that. No, no, no. In the context of there's anecdotal evidence and stuff, yes. But the whole point of that video was once upon a time, I would, like a lot of other atheists, glibly say, oh, there's no evidence for God. And then the pedantic people would come along and say, well, there's testimonial and anecdotal evidence, and that's actually evidence. And I would say, yes, right. but it's not accept that evidence. But it's not good enough evidence. It's not sufficient evidence. But the truth is the whole point of that video was to say that I may have, in fact, been wrong. And it may, in fact, be fair to say there is no evidence for the proposition God exists because it the type may of... It be fair to say that. However, what it, I'm seeking here is an alternative. An alternative to what? Well, to the question is, let's take, uh, say, the Oxford Dictionary of God, the monotheistic Christian God. He's defined as the creator. He's defined as the source of all moral authority. A creator of the universe, by the way, which I would guess incorporates everything in the universe, and is considered the supreme being. So let's start with creator. It's fine to say that you don't believe there is a creator God, nor is there not significant, uh, sufficient evidence, but my argument is much the same. I don't find sufficient evidence to an alternative. It's tough. So if, yeah. if, if, tough. if God okay. if there, if it, no, create the universe, Duke. how did it come to exist? We don't know. You don't know. We don't know. But so, do you and, have and any if the if the right answer, any any alternative? I mean, really, do you have any evidence that supports an alternative? Um, well, we have Big Bang cosmology that that explains the process as best we can understand, but that's not the same question. The issue like, here. There are four different. There are four different. It doesn't matter. Four it doesn't matter of how that happens. So Duke, none of them are confirmed. Duke, it doesn't matter. There's no. Okay. Let's say somebody's murdered, and we don't know who did it, but somebody suspects that the butler did it. Mm -hmm. Are we reasonable in concluding that the butler did it? Not without investigating. Okay. So now. We have if you a un investigate and you find that it doesn't look like the butler did it, then do you stop there or no. do you go find an alternative explanation? Y you keep exploring to the best of your ability, but you do realize that some murders go unsolved forever, right? Because there's just sure. an inability for us to invent. Okay, so now we have a universe. The question of God will go on uh, unsolved forever unless God reveals himself, too. Cool, so... Right, that's what we're waiting for. So I so, take it then... Well, I take it, I take it, for Duke, that Duke, I take it then with that statement from you, that you also don't believe in God, correct? No, not at all. All I'm suggesting is... No, not at all. If, if you disagree with the, with the prospect that there is a creator God, what, alter, what evidence do you have for an alternate explanation? I, really I neither... Much. You I, not, several different I don't theories. need any evidence for an alternative. Saying I don't believe something does not put a burden on me to come up with alternate explanations. No, it doesn't, but it makes no sense, and this is the point. It, it makes all the sense. You've already agreed that it makes at sense. At least anecdotal evidence or minimal evidence over somebody who has no evidence. Duke, your position all is essential. Duke, your position is 
Nobody can know whether or not the butler did it until the butler reveals himself. But I'm going to believe the butler did it anyway. That's your position. Yeah, but, it, but we're talking about different things. We're talking about the d demise of Steve. But that's not really what the, the, the question about God is. It's not. We have a universe. It's the origin. So We have a universe. Steve analysis, let's say Steve exists, but Steve's, but Steve's parents don't exist. How did Steve come to exist? Okay, I don't and need, say, I don't need. Is no, Duke, God, stop. Because there is stop. some evidence. Duke, there is, stop. There is a sufficient belief. I don't need a bullshit hypothetical about a person existing without parents. That doesn't do any of us any good. For you to even the whole suggest Steve something. Analogy doesn't really work either. The Steve analogy does work, uh, and you've already actually acknowledged that. That without supporting evidence, it's unwise and unwarranted to reach a conclusion. And it's unwise to just walk away and assume and just say, "Well, you know, the butler didn't do it." So Duke, who walked away? Did you listen so, to the last so call? Who did it? Let's Duke. Do, let's do, Duke. I can't. I can't. Duke. 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 Did you listen to the last call? portion of it i was actually watching tv waiting for you to come on well if you had been paying attention you would have heard us point out how absolutely bullshit it is to suggest that we have just walked away and ignored this we are the ones here on a show some of us for many many years continually asking what is the evidence that the butler did it and getting nothing but fallacies we're not the ones walking away from this the person who the people who are in intellectual jeopardy here are not those of us who are saying present the evidence. It's the people who are saying we believe the butler did it, but we can't present any evidence for it. Those are the people who are being unreasonable. And not only that, but you have to believe the butler did it too. No, I don't necessarily have to believe the butler did it because that's just a proposition. The butler did it. Could yeah, be. God and created is I'm also saying, just a proposition. Something else did it. If Steve, if Steve is killed and the butler doesn't exist, or the butler didn't do it, there has to be an alternate explanation. How do you know Steve this didn't have a heart attack? What I'm trying to get from atheists is some alternate explanation. How do you Tough. Know? What alternate explanation is there? I don't know how there many times. Tons. I don't I don't have sufficient evidence to support an alternate explanation. You don't have sufficient evidence to, to support your preferred explanation. So the, you have a preferred explanation right. without so, sufficient so, evidence. So how is your... Shut up. You have your preferred explanation without sufficient evidence, and you're looking at everybody else going, do you have any other alternatives? Whether or not people present other alternatives is irrelevant to what the truth is and what one is warranted to believe. So do you have evidence for your preferred... Oh my God, you talked all the way through that. Goodbye. I'm not letting you do that to Jenna on our first day. <laughs> Thank you. You don't get to just sit there and talk through, listen to the TV through the... <laughs> the other call that already answered your questions and then talk through while I'm trying to explain. Uh, Hooray. So, By the way, as a reminder, before we go on to the next call, this show is sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. You're welcome to come down if you are an atheist or atheist-friendly person. Visit the building not only while the shows are gone, but 11 to 9, 7 days a week, and there'll be dinner here after the show. Uh, if you're around, come on down. Yay. Yay. I, I, I just occasionally have to throw out old-style uh, announcements. It's, it's nostalgic. It's helpful. It's, helpful. It, it's funny because looking back on the show, like 15 or so years ago when, when I started, and uh, Ashley Perrion was the host. Hi. <laughs> you, you come down and hang out anytime you want, Ashley. <laughs> um, but there was a like almost a script for uh, the intro, and so they all sounded exactly the same. And for whatever reason, I just... And I just memorized it and went with it. I yeah. thought this was like, this is the intro you have to use. <laughs> and so my brain was like, hey, welcome to the Atheist Experience. It's sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, nonprofit educational, blah, blah, blah. And then I realized someday, oh, I don't have to say that word for word every time. <laughs> uh, being a free thinker allows me to float around and throw it in late in the show or whatever. But yeah. where are we going now? Uh, Jay's been on a while. Yep. Jay in Virginia. Hi, Jay. Hey. Hey, do you know Duke? Because he was also in Virginia. Uh, no. All right. No. Oh, you're gonna want to turn. You're gonna want to turn down. We can hear ourselves on a delay in the background. Uh, let's try to watch here. So, <laughs> um, I'm a, I'm an atheist. Um, I, I, I believe humans uh, create God. Oh. But um, that's not that's not my qu uh, question is. My question Wait, is, I, did, I didn't hear that. One more time, what was it you said you believe? 
I believe a uh, man created God. Okay. I see. I, I misinterpreted. <laughs> I'm sorry. Kind of nervous. It's my first time calling. <laughs> oh, no problem. Um, my question is, okay, I'm, a, I'm an atheist, but the uh, question is, um, uh, uh, like, do you believe in a supernatural like ghosts? Because every time I, I went to a trip, they showed like evidence, like videotapes and uh, VIP. And uh, I guess I'm not believing in the supernatural or anything, but uh, the evidence what show me uh, show me convinced me there uh, there's a a sp- uh, spirit uh, like a spirit a spirit ghost. What so what do you think? Uh, uh, my question is uh, uh, if, if 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 there's evidence of a supernatural. Uh, and uh, supernatural. Um, sorry, I'm kind of. Um, uh, uh, there might be a, a god or something if they, because uh, when they just uh, went to the trip, and um, wait, are you asking if we believe in ghosts? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't. Me neither. You don't. You don't. I don't. Uh. Maybe they show like the uh, the tapes or via VIP like of uh, of the uh, a voice form of evidence towards that. Tapes or VIP? What? Yeah, via uh, all these uh, the voice of vomit, uh, electronic yeah. voice phenomenon, EVF. Yeah. 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 yeah it, they show you, you that and the evidence. You might remember when I was uh, a teenager um, and active in the church. Uh, there was a trend focusing on backward masking in rock and roll music where you would play your records backwards and they would have mm-hmm. secret hidden messages. Do you remember that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Turns out we hear things. And it turns out that we have brains that try to make sense of things even if they don't necessarily make sense, which is why we see faces in things, you know, in tree bark and in bushes and in other things, because our brains are designed to recognize faces. It's one of the reasons why when there's a rustling in the brush, you make one of two mistakes. You either uh, assume that it's nothing and you get eaten, in which case you don't pass on your genes, or you assume it's something and you live to propagate. But you survived independent of whether or not there was a predator in the bush. And so that process has encouraged us to pass along flawed thinking and flawed reasoning because on occasion it has saved our lives. Similarly, not only are we there to recognize faces and potential threats, but we thrive on recognizing voices. Um, And we, you know how you can be in a crowded room and everybody's talking, but you can have a conversation with one person and you have no idea what anybody else is talking. It's like they all fade away. So you can focus in on that one thing. If you're listening to noise, or things that sound like voices or are voices being played in a weird sense, your brain almost has no choice but to try to make sense of it. And so that's, that's the best explanation I have for both backward masking and electronic voice phenomenon, things like that. Now, as far as the ghost story shows on, on the air quotes history channel and stuff like that, Uh, it's a bunch of edited garbage as far as I can tell. If we had discovered actual evidence for ghosts, it wouldn't be on a TV show that they tease for two weeks of we're going to this haunted house and did we actually find evidence of a ghost? (laughs) It would be before the Nobel Committee and everybody else of we have discovered the truth of what happens to souls after they die and we've, you know, evidence for the supernatural. You know, it's the same. It's a TV show. And maybe with all those camera crews and everything like that, they would have caught something on camera other than like, oh, this light lit up. Yeah. (laughs) You know? Well, well, I was, I I, I took a trip about paranormal. They they say they were skeptics, that they they, they use tools to investigate. Yeah. I thought, I thought, I thought thought they actually recordings and stuff. I thought, I thought that I believe there might be a, a supernatural. Yeah, one one key thing to remember is that anybody can say they're a skeptic and they might even be a skeptic and yet not be being skeptical about Mm -hmm. this particular subject. Skepticism is is something that is demonstrated 
uh, learn. as being applied to a claim and not just, hey, I'm a skeptic and I think that uh, the earth is flat. Because oh. any, anybody could say that. Well, you got my answer question. <laughs> yeah, so far, so far as I can tell, not only is there nothing supernatural, I don't even know how one would go about presenting evidence for the supernatural, because oh. let's say that well, we... Well, about, about a, a, a videotape, like a chair moved or something. You don't think... Have you never seen a movie that had ghosts in it? Yeah, I've seen movies. Okay. It's all uh, uh, fake and stuff. Yeah, so you, you have, let's say there's a videotape and a chair moves. What is the explanation for why that chair moved? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I just, it just said Good one. It moved its own. Yeah, I, I don't uh, know either, yeah. but I am aware that there are ways to fake that and that there are potential natural explanations where a breeze blew through and, you know, rocked a rocking chair um, without it having to be a ghost. Let's say, though, that we had a videotape of a closed room with no air circulating, and we were at least fairly confident that nobody was actively trying to trick us, you know, it was just a de facto kind of security tape, and a chair started rocking. How could we ever conclude that the best explanation is that there was a ghost? I thought um, the videotape just shows it. Yeah, but Everything's the videotape. What did it show? It showed a chair moved. But what did and it show? It what was, moved it? No, no, it just it just moved. It just it's like moved. I just saw it moved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what Jen is what Jen is pointing out is that what Jen is pointing out is that the tape is evidence that a chair moved, not evidence of how it moved. And the fact that we don't have an explanation for how it moved means that we don't have an explanation. It doesn't mean that we're justified in concluding that it was a ghost because we fairies. couldn't think. Of, yeah, or we couldn't think of anything else. Maybe God moved the chair. Oh, so it, it's we don't know what it is. Okay, All right. Yep. And it's okay to say that. Yeah, that's why I'm so kind of confused on the. <laughs> yeah. my, my brain kind of... No, it's, it's, okay. it's We're all that way. The chair, Getting yeah, the chair move, I thought, I thought that, I thought, I thought that there was uh, evidence of a supernatural. No, you got you to take each thing that happens and be like, okay, you, I think this happened or I think that's happened, and then you have to investigate. Then that's all we're doing. We're just taking every single claim and just investigating each one and trying to figure out if it's true or not. And if we don't know, that's all we can say. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, that, I think that's it. You got my question answered. All right. Yeah, cool. Keep keep reaching for I don't know until you have good reason to say, hey, I know. Yeah. That's about it. Thanks for calling. Thanks for the call. Uh, all right. We'll go Stephen in Australia. Thanks for waiting. Hi, Stephen. Thanks very much. Hi. What's going on? Uh, I'll be quick. I know it's late into the show. Oh, go ahead. Um, so I wanted, yeah, I wanted to just quickly run through. I hear a lot of arguments from theists about uh, what God is most, you know, like probabilistic arguments. So I'd say that, you know, a deist God, which means that, you know, to create a God which has no interactions with the current world is probably the most likely. Um, I don't know what that is, you know, 10% chance. It's up to you. But I think it's better to not make a conclusion on that, so remain agnostic. I don't think it's justified to say that that exists. Is that fair? Yeah, the, the thing is, so if you looked at all the various God claims, you could do it in a sense where you'd say, okay, this one is the, 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 the claim that has the fewest actual components. Hey, there's a deist God that doesn't inter interact with reality, and that, by, that God is by definition more plausible than uh, a Trinitarian God, which is more plausible than, I don't know, whatever the hell Scientology might have that <laughs> could potentially count as something godlike or supernatural. You could look at it that way, and then you could say, oh, well, of all these various gods, this one is the one that is most likely. Except that what if most likely is still 0% because we are beginning with 
it's like finding out which married bachelor is most likely to be your future non-husband. Uh, if they're all unlikely, if there's no demonstration that any of them are possible or probable, it doesn't really matter the fact that, you know, uh, hey, Jesus is less ridiculous than Jesus plus Birkenstocks. You know, Jesus barefoot, obviously we've added a new component and that makes it more unlikely. And plus, that one's even even more uh, likely than Jesus with pink Birkenstocks with rhinestones on them. None of that matters because ultimately the question is, do we have reason to believe that any of them are actually likely probable or true? So it's yeah. like, yeah. No, I agree with that. I think uh, my, my uh, kind of why I wanted to frame the argument was, I guess, uh, uh, the argument from failing to leave clear instructions. Uh, that ties into a little bit to the divine hiddenness yeah. thing that I've seen you talk about. But uh, basically, I just wanted to say, like, for people who make the argument that the Christian God is likely or probable, I would argue that a deceiving God or a troll God is more likely because of the evidence that we have, which is that you create a system where um, you give your message to only one prophet in a specific geographical region in the world um, that doesn't have, you know, discernible ways to uh, make it more true than any other claims. And then you only leave it so that those, your message can only be ever interpreted or uh, redistributed to people through flawed humans. So if you yeah. were a God trying to deceive people, I think he's done a pretty good job of creating the system that we've got. Um, I'm stumped, and I hope I don't sound rude when I ask this, but I just want to know why you want to know which one's more or less likely. If you, if you don't believe that they exist, then why do, you, why do you want to investigate and spend more time on deciding which is more or less likely? I like to challenge my opinions a lot. Um, so I'm always open to listening to fierce arguments. Um, the most common ones I hear are obviously, you know, oh, theistic we, arguments. We, we are too. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's what we've been advocating all, all show for sure over and over again. Um, I think what Jen's getting to is uh, your, this comparison, which I, I know wasn't your larger point because you were going for a version of argument from divine hiddenness, but uh, the larger point is that it doesn't matter which is more likely. Right, if like, we have no way to investigate to determine which of them, if any, are real. Right. It's like one person says Casper's wearing a pink dress and another person saying Casper's wearing a yellow hat. And I'm saying I don't care. And Until you demonstrate that Casper's real. Right. You know, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I think though that theists have, their, their probabilistic arguments are based, like Matt was saying, on, you know, arguments that sound reasonable or have some, you know, limited evidence, uh, you know, like, say, you know, testimony and things like that, it's, or historical it's, evidence. I, I like your argument from con confused revelation or disparate revelation, which, you know, I've heard in a variety of forms before. Mainly, I like it because it shows the, the, the preposterousness of a a loving, caring God that wants people to know, you know, there would be evidence for that. That's why earlier I was saying if I was God, there'd be evidence. It's... It's one of those things where one of the books I recommend most often is a book called Enumeracy by John Allen Paulus, which shows how bad we are at math and statistics and statistical inferences, and not just because we can occasionally lie with them, but because we're really bad at processing large numbers and improbabilities. So you could say, what are the odds that Matt would be sitting here today on the atheist experience answering calls in this particular outfit Given that, in order for that to occur, all the people who made these clothes had to have been born and had to have parents, and their parents had to meet, and Matt's parents had to meet, and Matt's parents' parents had to meet, and Matt's parents' 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 parents had to meet, and you can exploit all that to say that the it's just astronomically improbable that Matt is here. That is a process of lying with numbers, because the probability that I'm here on the atheist experience is exactly one. I, I am in fact here. And all of that other stuff becomes irrelevant in the face of the prima facie fact that I am here. However unlikely it was, it happened. 
And that's one of the ways that we confuse people. And that's why I was doing the Jesus with the pink Birkenstocks, with the rhinestones and stuff, because ultimately it doesn't matter. Once you've crossed the threshold of no reason to think this is real, to say there's even less reason than no reason to right. think it's real kind of goes off the rails. Yeah. I hope no, I wasn't I, being I insulting by asking you that. No, that's all right. I'm pretty pretty thick-skinned. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just really common that I find it. So it's like, oh, I can't think of an explanation or I can't understand it, therefore, you know, Yeah, God. I, I was just wondering. Yeah, it's the same frustration we feel. I'm going to I'm gonna try and get, we've got one more call to get to before we finish up the show, and there's going to be Chinese food down here at the building that I've been told to remind everybody about. Uh, but thanks for calling, and thanks for waiting. And, and I do like that version of the argument. No worries. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for calling. Cheers. All right, Sean in Pennsylvania, you get to be the last call for Jenna's first show. Hi. Hi. Oh, my God. <laughs> um... I'm excited to be chatting with you both. Awesome. And uh, Jenna, you, you, you told a lot, and I really understand, and uh, that's that's really cool of you to share that with us. And uh, Matt, I've seen a lot of what you shared, and I have a lot of respect for everything that you do. Thank you. I have come with a question, and it's a difficult one, and it's a problematic one. How do we have hope? Or how do we have hope without faith? Ah. Oh. Well, okay. I have a friend who wrote a book with that title. Or kind of, kind really? of that title. Hope After Faith was uh, Jerry DeWitt's book. What do you, how do you define hope and faith? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, for hope, I would go with... Um, Specifically, uh, uh, wishing good for the future, you know, like, uh, or, or, or even our expectation for a better future. And, and for faith, I, I would say that there's some sort of trust and belief that comes with that. Okay. Oh, okay. so that definition of faith. Faith and hope. Oh, I see. You're saying that they're the same thing, right? Well... So by, by faith, you're just, how can we have hope without faith? So my definition of faith it makes it useless for hope or anything else. Right. But what you seem to be talking about is we have to trust and have confidence. But have faith trust in and, right. yeah, but confidence can be rationally justified. Faith is irrationally justified confidence or a confidence that's disproportionate okay. to the evidence. Uh, but, but we can set the word aside. Um, how can we have hope? Well, for a lot of people, it's unavoidable. Hey, I hope this happens. I hope that happens. I'm optimistic about this. For some people, I'm not sure they can ever really have hope. The, the sort of mm -hmm. pessimistic mindset of everything's awful and cynical. So it seems to me that the best okay. way to, to foster hope is to teach people that both the overly exuberant optimism that flies in the face of evidence and the overly exuberant pessimism that flies in the face of evidence are both extremes that aren't warranted. And an actual honest assessment of the evidence will tailor your expectation of hope to that which is truly reasonable. So saying, I hope I win the lottery is, okay, we can calculate what the odds of winning the lottery are, and you can realize that that's, you know... Uh, uh, probably not a, a, a likely place to place your hope. But when I say, I hope Jenna and I have a good first show for her, that wasn't just, oh, I'm exercising faith. It's I'd already seen Jenna on the show. I knew a little bit. I know how the show goes. I have a mountain of evidence that leads up to saying, I'm incredibly optimistic that we will have a good show. That is hope that is warranted by evidence. It could turn out to not be true. The world is uncertain. But if you teach people skepticism, if you teach people uh, how to evaluate the evidence, I think hope thrives in that. And the hope that thrives in that is reasonable hope and not pie-in-the-sky hope. Well said. But how many arguments have you had the exact same way where you're not even 
don't you sometimes feel like you can have the arguments over and over and over again and no one's hearing and no one's understanding or people are no. choosing in? No, because I have thousands upon thousands of emails from people who've changed their mind because of what the show's done. I, every every oh. single convention I go to, there are numerous people who come up to thank me for what this show has done. For not, not not just for what I've done, but for what the ACA has done, for what every host and co-host on here has done, for what the other programs have done, Wait, because they do change I'm minds. Not you of anything. I, 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 I think everything that you're doing is great, and I and I'm no, you, really you, happy to. You, I'm, I'm not I'm not knocking you on this. I'm just saying you, you you suggested that maybe I was sitting here frustrated by the futility of arguing with people who don't change their mind. There are people who don't change their mind, and there are people who do. Some of them call, some of them watch. Okay, so going back to how can we have hope, it's, it, it, you know, like um, we can know uh, empirically that bad things are going to happen, no matter how good of a person you are. Yeah, and we can know that good things are going to happen, no matter how good or bad you are. Well, I mean, I, I, I suppose so, but I, I, the, the, the point that I'm making is in, 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 in this world where you can actually uh, uh, lie out every statistical prob probability and, uh, uh, and, and realize in this universe how statistically insignificant we are. I mean, like, our, our, our lives are tiny on a, uh, a biological scale, let alone a geological scale, let alone a astronomical scale. What, what does the um, scale have to do with anything? The fact, so an ant could potentially have hope even though it's, you know, potentially less, none of this makes any difference to whether or not you can reasonably have hope. All you need to reasonably have hope is evidence that there's a possible or likely good outcome. So, so then the is, <laughs> then there comes in the moral uh, question of what is a, a good outcome? What is a, 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 a you know? I mean, you know, like that. Actually, <laughs> Sean, it's irrelevant. Do you agree that both good and bad things happen? Um, You've already said that bad yeah, things so happen. I, do you think only bad things happen? Do I think only bad? No, I don't think only bad things happen. I, but I'm, I don't think that it's hard to... Like, is anything that is a fact good or bad? It, well, ha that, is, that is a complete diversion from what we're talking about. Do you think that good things happen? Um... I don't know. I believe things. I don't understand why this is any harder than asking, do you think bad things happen? You, you, are, no, you, you are happy asking, instantly to say that bad things asking, happen. And when I ask you if good things happen, you hem and haw. Yeah. Why, why don't you think good? You know, you're asking a subjective question about a, a, an objective, you know, like. How, no. He just asked, I, do you think good things happen? I. That's Do it. I think good. I, I don't know whether or not. Like, I think that I have had a good life. I think that my life has been. I, this isn't so you're about saying your you don't know if, I, You're saying honest. you don't know if those things are good. Is that what you're saying? I, 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 I think that I have. You know, like it's hard because good and bad is a moral judgment. And no, it's, it's not. 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 I'm not talking. Way. I'm not talking about morality at all. We can look at it entirely from your subjective personal opinion about whether or not a consequence is good or bad. In your personal subjective opinion, do both good and bad things happen? Uh, do both? Yeah, well, I mean, I, again, it's a subjective opinion. I said yes. in your <laughs> personal subjective fucking opinion. <laughs> Yeah, so, 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 I just, so you're asking me subjectively. Yeah. Do you, Sean, personally think, yeah. in your opinion, that good things happen and that bad things happen? I, I, I do, Matt Dillahunty, yes. my personal <laughs> opinion. But that's <laughs> then, It doesn't have to be. Here's the thing. You're not, okay, we've gotten to the point. I happen to agree with you that 
in my personal subjective opinion, good things happen and bad things happen. Whether or not this thing that I thought was good ultimately turns out to be bad or might be bad for somebody else, or if we go down the, the rabbit hole of all the potential butterfly effect things or anything else, the truth is I'm convinced that there are good things that happen and bad things that happen. There are bad things that have, that have happened to me in the last couple of weeks. Um, some, things are, are, some things are bad in some ways and potentially good in other ways, but I would say that a good thing that happened is that we found Jenna to come on and, and co-host the show. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and say that in my personal subjective opinion, that's a good thing. It might turn out to be a terrible thing. Hang on, Sean. Hang on. Hang on, Sean. Hang on. I'm sorry. It might turn out to be a bad thing. I might change my mind on it. But I have, no, no, I really I have the ability to look at this and say, holy crap. Hey, if you have I, the ability to I'm going to make this real easy, Sean. I'm going to leave this building in a little while and hop in my truck and drive home. Now, making it home safely without any damage to myself or my truck, I'm going to call it a good thing. Getting in an accident on the yeah. way home, I'm going to call it a bad thing. Would you agree? Yeah, that, well, I would, would you agree kind of that that would be good thing and bad thing? Yes, I, 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 can, I can subjectively agree. Would you, <laughs> would you also agree that there are objective facts about reality that determine the likelihood of both me getting home and me getting in an accident. Yes, and I think that those objective truths make life a little harder. Well, that's and, not, and, and that's not the point. Harder to have hope. Who says life is no, supposed to be? Oh, my God. The original point, how do we have hope? I'm getting to that. If you'd stop talking about how life is hard. Well, we've gotten to a point that I'm either going to get home safely, which we would agree was a good thing, or I'm going to get in an accident and potentially die or get hurt, which is a bad thing. And that the truth about which of those happens is based on objective facts about reality. The maintenance of my vehicle, the other drivers on the road, all of these things. And so I can assess the data to determine a likelihood for getting home safely or a likelihood for getting in a wreck. And because I don't know what the outcome is, I can have hope, and my hope can be based on the objective evidence, the hope for that goal. Doesn't matter how hard life is, doesn't matter what your subjective opinion about good or bad are, once you've decided this is good, and we can make some assessment about it, I can hope that I get home safely, and I can hope that you get home safely, and I can hope that other people get home safely, and they can hope the same and, thing and, for and me. For the record, I, I, I am a person, any one of my friends will tell you, uh, when I part ways with anyone, um, I say, you know, drive safely, get home safely, you know, and, and I understand, you know, that being on the road, there's a, there's more probabilities of accidents. I bicycled uh, across Pennsylvania last August. I bicycled down to Florida this winter, kind of. I cheated and took some trains because winter weather is not something you want to bicycle through. So for hope. So you weren't <laughs> particularly hopeful about the weather. <laughs> no, I mean, like... So yeah, I, I mean, you know, like I had, I had backup plans, I, and and I, 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 I do, you know, like I, I, I hope that my life is going to be okay, but I don't know, is that not based on faith? Hope isn't knowledge, and hope can be based on reason. That's it. Well, I mean, um, yeah. Uh, I, I, especially when you say it, especially with respect to you, it, it sounds right, but I'm... I'm going to let Jenna say it. Sure. <laughs> or, or, what, or whatever she wants. She gets to say whatever she wants. It's not like I need her... To, please echo what I said, no. Jenna. So, echo, that it sounds so, <laughs> so hope... I mean, I have hope about things all the time. I mean, I, and I don't have faith. The way that I define faith is believing in something without evidence. I define hope as wanting something to happen. Um, I have hope that, I mean, I, I don't know how that... It's, if, if, we, if we look at hope in the way that we're talking about, all it is is optimism. Yeah. And if your optimism is out of tune with the facts of reality, that's delusion. But if your optimism is in tune with the facts of reality, not only is there nothing wrong with that, but that's exactly what we should promote. And I don't even know how it could be a question of how one could have hope. All it is is, are you having reasonable expectations based on the available evidence? 
we all of our lives are uncertain. Nobody knows what's going to happen to a, a second fr from now with regard to everything. And so we're constantly, well, you, you're either optimistic or pessimistic. And all I'm saying is that at the extremes of those where they're not particularly warranted, that's a problem. But in the middle, both your optimism and your pessimism may be justified by the evidence. Well, yeah, I mean, if if we look at the evidence, uh, we we see people uh, that are more comfortable with uh, driving thousands of miles in a a, a truck full of uh, uh, high high ex like ex fuel. You know what I mean? Like explosive. You yeah, know, you know why? How many of those tend to blow <laughs> up and kill people? How often does that happen? Considering in, in the grand scheme of fuel being transported around the country. How often and do what, you know, and, and I agree that statistically that is rather rare, but those same people might who are driving those trucks might be afraid of flying. Okay. I'm not saying that everybody's optimism or pessimism is justified. I pointed out at both the extremes it's not. Why would you come up with an example that's in the extreme? Basically, you're saying, hey, there are people who have unwarranted concerns about the universe. Yes, there are. No, but okay. So, is is it possible that it's true that there are people who have warranted concerns about the nature of the universe that are pessimistic or without hope? Or I, I, I literally you know, just said that. <laughs> I literally just said both your optimism and your pessimism may be warranted by the actual evidence. For example, I'm pessimistic that I will win the lottery, even if I go and buy a ticket because I know the odds are incredibly against me. And, and yeah, absolutely sensible. Um, but, you know, so many people optimistically buy that ticket anyway. Okay. A lot of people believe in God. Uh, yeah. Let's, I, let's stop I, pointing I, to I, the exceptions to the rules of rationality as if it disproves rationality. Okay, but so how can we rationally have hope if we don't have faith in something that hasn't happened yet. If, if all you mean is confidence, then your confidence is in the data that you have that tells you how likely something is or isn't to happen. It's not faith, it's just confidence. It's, it is a reasonable, it is, I have expectations, reasonable expectations based on the data. That's completely different from faith in a religious sense. But if you want to call it faith, then I have faith in data. I have confidence no, so I, in data. I, I, I agree with you, and I have confidence in data. Then how can you still have this question? Just look at the data. Doesn't it seem like things are going more wrong than right? Wait. And that's something to worry about. And, and, and how wrong. can we have hope that it's going to be okay? That what's going to be okay? What's going more wrong? That's been going on for generations. Sean, what's going more wrong than right? Um, uh, well, I mean, you know, uh, I, I really... Uh, the environment, uh, you know, like the, that, that climate change denial... Sure, am I optimistic about our future? No, Sean. To support that climate change denial has any evidence behind it. There's no data behind that. You're sure and, about that? And, and You're sure that there's no... Uh, wait, did you say that there's no data behind climate change? No, climate change denial. <laughs> oh, okay. None. <laughs> Yeah. Sean, Sorry. <laughs> Sean, the fact that you can point to examples of things that we shouldn't be optimistic about doesn't mean that there aren't other things that we should be optimistic about. Well, but you keep using the word um, hope. And when, when I think about hope and, and climate change, I'm like, okay, I hope that the world's not going to, you know, burn us all to pieces. But it I might hope happen. I that we're not going to experience uh, global floods and increasing tornadoes, but... You know, or in hurricanes and other uh, 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 climate events that, you know, like so from what I understand from the science, this is probably likely to happen. So how do we have hope? You don't, okay. I mean, I think that's just a human thing. You just do. I, I, I don't you know don't. that I have anything more to say. I've already pointed out, pointing out something that we don't necessarily have warranted hope in doesn't mean that there's not other things we do have hope. If you mean, how do we, if, if your whole concern is, 
let's talk about climate change. How, how can we be hopeful and optimistic in the face of the data? Maybe you can't, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other things that you can't be hopeful in. Uh, all right. So I see. I see what you're saying, and and and, and I respect that. But doesn't it get hard? <laughs> you know, like let's say when you look, you it, it doesn't matter, Sean. Sean, yes, shit gets hard. Life can be hard. If I have stage four cancer and I'm lying in an optical uh, hospital bed, and we've tried everything, and there's no more treatment, do I have hope that I'm going to continue living much longer? No, I have no reasonable hope. I can, I can wish all day long, but I don't have a reasonable hope that I'm going to continue living. Does that mean that I'm completely devoid of hope? No, because I can have hope that I don't suffer as much pain in the benefits of medication. I can have hope that my family and friends who love me will come and spend time with me at the end of my life and remember me fondly afterwards. There are still things that I can find to have hope in, even in the face of almost certain death. It's if, if all yeah. you're concerned about is how can I have hope in this grand sense that everything's going to turn out all right, you can't and you shouldn't because everything's not always going to turn out all right. There's a mix of good and bad. Which, everything's on a spectrum. And we, we, we finally sorted that out about the, the good and bad a while ago. Mm -hmm. There are things that you can be hopeful about and there's things that you probably can't be. When, they, when you can find nothing to be hopeful about, that's a serious concern. That, that is a concern where I would recommend somebody in a position where they le legitimately cannot be hopeful about anything should probably get a hold of the secular therapist problem and find somebody to, to counsel them because you, you, that part position is not right. Part of the reason I'm asking this question is because uh, I, I recently lost a friend uh, to suicide and um, and I felt like I should have been there. Like uh, I, I assured him that uh, I would get in touch with him and we we would hang out and I feel like I, I missed an opportunity. Um, I'm sorry. You know, like, it's, it's hard to, to, to know um, uh, what, what you can do and what you can't. And I'm not a professional therapist and I don't even know if I could have fixed that or if anything I could have done would have changed anything, you know? Um, yeah, that's hell. It sounds like you might need to check out that secular therapy project if you can. <laughs> I'm no, I'm not trying to say anything. I'm, I'm just saying it's helpful. I, I'm seeing one. If I was in your it's position, helpful. having lost somebody to suicide and having the concerns that you have, I would reach out to the Psycho Therapist Project as well. And while I'm not a therapist, I'll say this. When my grandma died a couple weeks ago, I had a chance to go visit her a week before she died, and I opted not to. It was, the logistics just didn't work out. I could have made it work, but it just didn't. And so when they called me and said, yeah. you know, hey, she's going to die in a couple of hours, the first thing that went through my head was, I'm a terrible fucking grandson. Why didn't I go see her? I mean, I knew, you know, we knew she was probably within 30 days. And I realized that my reasons for not doing it weren't entirely selfish, but even if they were, that, that's not necessarily a problem. I had seen her at Christmas time and we'd had a good visit. And she knows, she knew that I loved her. She knew that I cared. She knew that I was there. And the fact that I wasn't there the week before uh, it isn't necessarily a problem. And there may be actually good things that come out of this. For example, my memory, my last memory of my grandmother is of us sitting around uh, the table playing cards and laughing. And that's a very different memory to hang on to than uh, watching her suffer and die at the end. The one thing that I've learned about this connection of friendships, I often have felt, oh, I'm a terrible friend. Oh, I'm a terrible uncle. I only get to see my niece and nephew maybe, maybe at Christmas time. I'm a terrible uncle. I, I forget birthdays, you know, and I live 14 hours away if I was driving and I've got all this stuff going on in my life and I'm not being the sort of uncle that I should be or that I wish I could be, et cetera. And yet my niece and nephew don't have that perception of me. And the friends that I had in high school, there's only, a, we had 900 plus people graduate 
my year. They split the school in half after that. I had a bunch of friends in high school. There's probably two that I've remotely kept in touch with over the years. And either one of them, mm-hmm. I could call them up right now and we start over right from scratch. But you know what else? They're not keeping in touch with me either because they have lives. And my, 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 okay. friend, my friend that I was talking about here in Austin who had stints put in and was in a coma for over a week who I was almost certain was going to die, has recovered, gotten out of the hospital, had to go back into the hospital just the other day and is now back out of the hospital as of, I think, this evening. And I haven't, because of the travel, I haven't been up to see him as much as I would like. But I'll tell you this. Every time I start to feel bad about the fact that I didn't go up and visit Sean at every possible opportunity, I know that Sean is like a brother to me and knows that I would probably just didn't have the opportunity to go through there or had other reasons, and it doesn't diminish how much I cared about him at all. That's a I tough thing to grip. That's, that's, a tough, that's a tough thing to come to grips with, that you're not nearly as bad as you are, as you think you are. And the fact that you think that you might have done something bad actually shows how decent you are. Because if you were truly somebody who didn't care about your friend, you couldn't possibly be feeling remorse about it now. And this is a natural part of mourning somebody that you've lost, is the what could I have done different or how could I have shown that I love them more? We all do that. As far as I can tell, and I'm not a therapist, that's completely normal. And one of the things you should do is forgive yourself. Well, I'm doing the best I can, and it's not just for my friends. It's for everyone I know, everyone I encounter. And it's really sad often because there's so much that I wish I could explain and I wish I understood. Yeah. And I'm trying to listen and I'm trying to understand and I'm trying to, you know. Keep trying. You have to keep trying, and this may be the answer to your question about how do you have hope? Because if you stop trying, you're never going to have hope. Yeah. You have to keep trying, and we all do. And we're all going to get it wrong, and we're all going to screw up, and we're going to not care enough about somebody at exactly the right time. Mm-hmm. Maybe I had somebody contact me a week ago that was in an email that was distraught and needing help, and it came at a particularly bad time for me where I couldn't, I, hadn't, I didn't have enough spoons to deal with my own issues, let alone somebody else's, and I didn't talk to them. And yet that email from somebody I don't even know has been playing on a loop in my head going... Don't forget about that. Don't forget about that. The second you get time where you're in a headspace where you could potentially help somebody, talk to them. And that's for somebody I don't know. You're not a bad friend. And the fact that you're concerned about this and concerned about the disparity of all these big issues and you're feeling the weight of a million things on you right now and it feels like, oh my gosh, I'll never be hopeful. I'll never have hope again in the grand sense. And all I can say is, It may feel like that, but the data shows that it's not that. That good things are going to happen, that bad things are going to happen, and that you can, in fact, be hopeful about a great many things, especially when you are putting in the effort to to push that hope. Doesn't mean you're going to get what you want. Doesn't mean everything's going to work out in the end. But hope keeps away despair, and despair is going to end all of our hope. And so even on occasions where it's irrational to have hope, I understand why people... Uh, despair is real, and and I, I think you know it too. Yeah. And I think we all know it. And, 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 and I think that to, to take some hope over the truth of despair takes a little bit of a leap of faith and that's problematic for uh, an atheist for... Uh, but it doesn't. Uh, 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 it doesn't take a leap of faith, Sean. Here's the thing. If you're hopeful, if you force yourself to be hopeful and optimistic, even when it doesn't seem that that's the case, do you think you'll be better off having done that? Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I, I know that I've gotten better off doing exactly right. that. Right. The data shows that there's a benefit to being hopeful, even in the face of overwhelming odds. That's the thing that you have confidence in, the data that shows that hope is better than despair, mm-hmm. not faith that everything's going to work out, but confidence that everything 
is going to be better under the banner of hope than it is under the banner of despair. Okay, so what if that's just polishing the brass on the Titanic? You know, like, I, 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 I can smile while the world burns. Is it, you know, like, I, I, I'm really pointing to, like, uh, some existential, like, isn't it, like, even if we try to make the world better, can we? That's what we're trying to do right How now. Much? Do you think we can make the world better if we don't try? No, we, we certainly can't if we don't try. But That's also, all I need. Like, there are people who tried to make the world better that failed in epic ways. And, uh, you know, like, I don't want to tread on Godwin's law. But we learn from failures, too. <laughs> how, many, how many fuel trucks had to blow up before they got, became more safe? To where drivers, you know, I remember an episode of Little House on the Prairie. Yeah. <laughs> where Paul, <laughs> Paul had to drive a wagon of nitroglycerin rattling around in the back of this wagon. <laughs> yeah, I don't find that to be a particularly optimistic exercise, but we've learned from those mistakes and we do a lot better now. And the only thing I need to give me hope is the awareness of what happens when we lose hope. Well, if you look over just human history, there's so much evidence of and examples of what happens when you think that things are go not going your way and you should stop trying and then you keep trying and good things happen, you know, wars and all kinds of just human evolution in general. There's so many things that we've learned just over history that have shown us that if you keep trying, things happen. And I, I hate to do this because this is an incredibly important call. Uh, I'm going to put you on hold. And I'll be happy to sit around and talk to you a little while after the show's over. But there's a bunch of people on the other side. There's Chinese food coming, and we're already 30 minutes over on this. So I'm going to put you on hold for a minute, but I'll be right back. And at this point, because uh, we ran so much over, I want to thank Jenna for coming in and doing the show today. Yay. And everybody who showed up down here at the studio. And it's time for some quick reminders of things that we've already said. Uh, number one, there's a community here. If there's not a community where you are, you can either move or you can build a community there. Because one of the things that we can be confident about is that irrespective of our views on religions or gods, we're still human beings. And by and large, most of us are social creatures. And most of us who have been in position where we don't believe what the majority believes have been in a position of feeling ostracized. Building these communities is important. Having these conversations is important. But if you find yourself in a position where you are alone, isolated, the only godless heathen you know or whatever your preferred label is for whatever ostracized you or marginalized you, there are communities that you can reach out to, and if you can't find one in your area, you can contact Recovering From Religion. Daryl Ray will be here in a couple weeks. We'll be doing more talking about Recovering From Religion. There's a Secular Therapist Project so that if you find that you need some counseling, and almost everybody does, I would say, at some point, uh, if not frequently, you can now get connected with someone who's not going to, you know, preach at you or talk about your spirituality or, you know, any, any of those things you don't need. This is science-based medicine in the best possible sense as we try to rebuild communities because people finding their way out of religion, people suffering with the loss of loved ones uh, without the fantasies of a heaven or a God are often put in positions where they absolutely need somebody, anybody. If you're that person, there are places that you can reach out to. And if you're not that person, you can be the somebody that that person gets to talk to. We'll see you next week. Me and, uh, oh, I don't know, Eric Murphy, I think, is on next week. But take care. There's the guys who make all this happen. All right, back there.